The title of the message this evening is Where is the Promise of His Coming? And um, unfortunately, this is one of the biggest questions that a lot of uh, either non believers or very big doubting believers are asking themselves. Um, but before we dive into that one, who would believe that in less than two years, in less than two years, the United States of America pulled out of the Iran deal, imposed very harsh sanctions on Iran's oil and metal industry, moved its embassy to Jerusalem, <laughs> recognized Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights, declared the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terror organization and the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. None of these things could have happened unless God did a miracle to this country with this administration. And you don't have to be in love with the personality of a specific leader. You have to look at the policy of a leader. And, um, and this is how we need to look at things. And to me, every, every morning waking up and seeing more and more, I mean, having one more thing added to this list, it's amazing. It is beyond beyond amazing. I am amazed. I am grateful. I believe that... Maybe this is what America today is for, and it's all about, for such a time as this. And I, I had a chance to uh, share with congressmen from different states uh, last week in D.C., and, and Steve was there with me. And uh, it was uh, interesting that um, sometimes your own congressmen are not even aware of the magnitude of the decisions that your administration take and the magnitude of it all around the world. The Trump effect is shaking planet Earth, basically. All around, everywhere from Indonesia all the way across the Middle East, to uh, the, the um, European side, all the way up to uh, for Mexico and Canada and America. It's, it's quite amazing how, how God can use a person. And again, it's not that person, it's what he's doing, what he's standing for. And this is amazing, and I'm so amazed. But I must say, however, we have... Too many people that still doubt. And there are those who will always be the naysayers. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were, from the beginning of creation. In fact, Jude, there's only one chapter, so verses 17 to 19. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. And these are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the spirit. And this is an amazing thing that we're watching. While God is doing his thing in the world. While the fig tree comes back to life. And we are the only generation since the time of Jesus Christ to see Israel back in its land. To, we are the only generation since the time of Jesus Christ to see Jerusalem back as our capital. We are the only generation since the time of Jesus Christ that we don't have to say we hope for it. We, we pray for it. But we see the day approaching. We see with our very eyes. 
And yet, we are even more so today surrounded by those naysayers that will tell you, where is the promise of his coming? There's a promise here. And when is that promise? What is that promise? Who is the, the one who promised? And why is it? And who is the one who doubts the promise? So these are so many questions that we have. So first of all, we, we, we ask ourselves, okay, the scriptures are telling us that it is going to be in the last days. And make no mistake, a lot of people are saying, if I only saw Jesus today, I would have believed. Well, the people who saw Jesus then did not believe. Faith is not about what you see. And you understand that in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the definition of what the last day is all about is quite, quite clear. The last days began right there at the time of Jesus. The Bible says God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So through Jesus, when Jesus came, God spoke to the world, and that started that began the last days up until Jesus the prophets were talking about him promising about his soon coming we know that Simeon that old man was waiting for the consolation of Israel was patiently waiting for the coming of the Redeemer people were longing for it people were hoping for it people were praying for it and then he showed up and the last days began because he's now fulfilling Everything. And so the last days started. And who are those people that are mocking, doubting the scoffers? The Bible says in Jude, they, these people, these mockers, these people would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. 1 Peter 2, 1 to 3, therefore laying aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy, envy and all evil speaking as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. People who never tasted the graciousness of the Lord, they never really, they don't even know him probably. They think they do. They don't lay aside the malice. They feed by it. They don't lay aside the deceit. This is their modus operandi. This is the way they operate. They don't even tell you the truth uh, to your face. They're hypocrites. By the way, Hippocrates in the Greek is a mask. I don't know if you know that. In the theater world of those days, the mask that they were using during a show was called Hippocrates. That's why hypocrites are people who are putting on themselves something that they're not. Envy. So much of why they tell you that your hope is not valid, that the promise is not there. It's because they envy. They look at you. They see people with hope. They see people with great expectation. That expectation that gives, give, brings forth holiness and righteousness. And they look at their life. It's envy. Evil speaking. That's why we as newborn babes, we need to desire the pure milk of the word. I'm not even sure how much they find themselves in the word. That we may grow thereby. If indeed we have tasted, the Lord is gracious. Proverbs 13, 1 says, A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. These people, they're not even willing to listen to a rebuke. They know better. They know everything. And what is it that they mock you for? They're saying, where is the promise of his coming. Where is it? Show it to me. I don't believe it. Interesting. They're doubting the coming of Christ to his people. 
They're basically saying, look, yeah, 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 he was here. Yeah, he said things. But you have to take things in the right context. Look, ever since our fathers were here and they died, things are the same. <laughs> things are the same for them, maybe. For, for a newborn, spirit-filled believer, things are not the same. They can never be the same. You saw my testimony. If things were the same, I wouldn't be alive today. They doubt the coming of Christ to his people. They doubt the literal promise. They start speaking in a figurative way. Interesting. You know, I'm saying to myself, when you talk about Christ and you deny his resurrection, your whole faith is basically gone. But when you talk about Christ and you don't deny his resurrection, but you deny his coming back to take us, then what's the point of his resurrection? Doubting the literal promise of his physical return to this earth, not to touch earth with his feet yet, but to meet us in the cloud and take us to be with him. John 14. So where I am, you will also be. Not where you are, I'm coming to be so too. He says, I will take you and receive you unto myself. This is a very interesting word in the Hebrew and in the Greek. To receive is to take to yourself. Mm. It's interesting because those people are just telling you, look, the world is the same. It's all the same from the time of our fathers. Nothing is changing. These are the same people who are really acting as in the days of Noah, basically, if you really think about it. Everybody knows that in the days of Noah, there were very few people that prepared themselves for something great. Yet the rest of them, what is it that they did? The Bible says in Matthew 24, But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. Which is an amazing picture of us being taken out of here. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of of the son of man be. They just didn't want to hear what Noah had to say. They didn't want to listen to the warnings that God through Noah was speaking to the people. So just like those scoffers, okay, you know, everything is the same. <laughs> and why are they doing that, do you think? To put people to sleep and steal their hope. You see, the hope of the coming of Jesus is the most important thing that a believer can hold on to today. And is the number one thing Satan wants to steal from you. And he is going to use people, sometimes from within, most time from outside. But he will always bring those scoffers to always tell you where is the promise of his coming. They doubt his promises. They doubt his appointed times. And they doubt the redemption of our bodies. You see, they don't, they don't say, oh, I don't believe we are saved or redeemed. They don't understand that there is awaiting for us another redemption. Not the redemption of our soul, but the redemption of our body. In Romans chapter 8, it says so. We better not get used to this body. This is a very lowly body, the Bible says. I don't know if you know that. Put your picture next to you. Picture from 20 years ago next to you. <laughs> You're dying. You look terrible today compared to 20 years ago. <laughs> Put as much makeup as you want. Go to the best plastic surgeon. You will never be like 20 years ago. And let me tell you, folks, because this is a lowly body, the body that is in the, pro in the process of decay. This body is... He must wear in corruption in order to make it to heaven. We, can, we will smell bad in heaven. 
in this body. We have to have a new body in order to get there. So there has the promise that he will come, the promise that there is a set time, and the promise that he will take us, take us as we are right now. The redemption of our body. These are the tactics of the enemy. So many churches around the world teach universalism. Universalism, everybody's saved. That's it. Through one man, sin came to the world. Through another one, redemption and salvation came to the world. That's it. All men are saved. In fact, there is one theology called the finished work eschatology. It's one of the worst things I've ever heard coming, originating from the United States and poisoning the whole world with short little video clips of basically saying that all has been fulfilled already in the year 70 AD. Thus, don't expect a rapture. Don't expect tribulation. Don't ex there is no heaven. There is no earth. There is no nothing. Looking around, if this is, if this is it, I'm pretty, I'm pretty uh, disappointed, <laughs> I must say. You know, I have a, a friend, a pastor, dear friend. He lives in the Philippines. And one day, I get a, an email from someone telling me that this friend uh, decided that he believes that uh, all men are safe. And I said, ah, I know this friend. He's a great friend, and why would you say something like that? So I invited that friend to dinner, and uh, I could not believe to what my ears were hearing. He, he actually gave me three personal questions. Actually, some of them are questions, some of them are... He basically said, uh, I no longer have the stress and the burden I am free at last. I said, what do you mean? He says, I don't have to preach to people that they have to get saved anymore because all people are saved. I, I, don't have, I, I don't wake up in the morning with a burden for the lost. He said, Pastor, do you understand what you're telling me right now? You've been leading hundreds of people to Christ. What happened? He said, well, I finally found the truth. I need to go and apologize to all the people I, people I led to Christ. I said, wow. Can we ever live in this world without being burdened by this dying world? How can we? You know, in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 16 to 33, I say again, let no one think me a fool, if otherwise at least receive me as a fool, that I also may boast a little, what I speak, I speak not according to the Lord, but as if we're foolishly in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I also will boast. For you put up with fools gladly, since you are yourself art wise. For you put up with, with it if one brings you into bondage, if one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face, to our shame, I say, that we were too weak for that. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as as a, uh, as a fool, I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths, once I was stoned, three times I was uh, uh, shipwrecked, a night 
and day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in, in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and in nakedness, besides the other things, what come upon me daily? My deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak? I am not, am I not weak? Who is made to stumble? And I do not burn with indignation. If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Artius the king was guarding the city of Damas of, of the Damascians with a garrison and, and desiring uh, to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escape from his hands. That's someone who was burdened. This is true care for the people. How can we wake up in the morning thinking, everybody's saved. I don't need to do anything anymore. When we look, turn on TV, open a newspaper, watch the news online. Actually, just go around the city. This world is getting crazier and crazier. The ungodliness, the wickedness, the cruelty, everything is intensifying by the minute. And you're going to tell me that there is no burden in the heart of the believer for the lost You doubt the literal promise? It's very interesting. Because he asked me also, Amir, don't teach on the rapture. He said, there is no rapture. Of course, there is no rapture. You think this is it? You doubt the literal promise of Jesus to his disciples to come and take them. Well, I want to tell you something. I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which I shall be re revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willing, but because of him who subjected in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that we, the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs to Together until now, not only that, but within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Paul is writing these words to a church he's never been to. He never visited Rome even one single time before he wrote this letter. He's writing the letter to the Romans. This is the longest epistle Paul ever wrote to any church ever. And he wrote it with the knowledge that there is no situational matters he needs to deal with. Tell this one not to do this one and tell that one not to say this one. He doesn't know anyone there. The entire book of Romans is Pure doctrine and the doctrine of the hope that we must have, of the fact that we must wait with perseverance, of the fact that is coming a day where not only the souls, not only the spirit, our body is going to be redeemed out of this world. 
First Thessalonians 4, I do not want to be, I want, want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. He says, guys, even if some of our brothers and sisters died, if they are believers, thank you, Lord. Because you don't have that lifestyle of having no hope like so many. He said, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this way... For, for, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. When Paul says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, Paul basically says, okay, I'm telling you exactly what God is speaking. Okay, it's not my opinion. It's not my theology. Look what God says. He says this. He says that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, he said, comfort one another with these words. Every day, remind yourself that your citizenship is not here anymore. You have a heavenly citizenship. When you die, you don't die. You go home. Going home where you belong. Okay? When, when somebody dies here, he just falls asleep. And it's interesting, you know, when, when your child falls asleep in the living room and you take him all the way to his bedroom, he wakes up in his bedroom. We fall asleep here, we wake up there. Good deal. And that's the comfort we need to comfort one another with these words. Don't listen to those naysayers. Don't listen to those, to those uh, uh, um, I, they are scoffers and, 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 and they are mockers. The easiest thing to mock uh, uh, in our faith is the rapture. Why? Because it sounds really out of this world. <laughs> I mean, think about it. We're gone. But hey, was the parting of the Red Sea not something else? <laughs> Why is the rapture your only problem? I mean, wasn't Jesus taken in the cloud? What about Elijah with all that amazing drama? I mean, what about the Jordan River rolling all the way back and, and piling water all the way to the sky as a pillar, letting a million, almost a million and a half Israelites crossing at the same time? How come the, you have a problem with the rapture of the church and you can accept all the other things? Isn't God the God of miracles? Yes. I mean, you want God to just be an ordinary God. And just the world to be an ordinary world. And things as they always been. This is, this is like pu putting you to sleep. It's amazing. John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus said, look, I need to go first. I need to prepare a place for you. Okay? So stay here. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He'll comfort you. He'll guide you. He'll be with you. Okay? I'm not leaving you as orphans. Don't worry. But, he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you where? To myself that where I am. Where is Jesus now? At the right hand of the Father. So where I am... There you may also be. And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. And then Thomas says, show us the way. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's an amazing promise that we have here. And the third thing that pastors told me in that dinner that almost 
I almost choked to death during that dinner, is your messages cause people to fear and doubt their salvation. I spoke to so many people that call me after you teach, they're afraid. Wow, I didn't know that. I looked at the mirror, do I look that scary? I mean, think about it. It's only sin that causes us to hide from fear. I mean, I'm thinking about the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for, for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree desirable to make one wise. She took of it fruit and ate and she also gave to her husband with her and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened that they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. First sin, a result of rebellion, brought forth shame and fear, and therefore hiding. So when, when you preach the word of God and someone suddenly is afraid, many times it's because there is something wrong with his life. And there is fear. Now, make no mistake, by the way, walking with God gives us confidence. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 32, the work of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. And if that's not enough, in 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we, we clearly can see that if all that, when you preach, when you preach about the, the soon return of Jesus, and somebody is afraid that Jesus is coming soon, there is only one reason he's afraid. He's not ready. He is not ready. You know, Bible prophecy is not to scare, but it's to prepare. You have to remember that. The Bible wants us to learn what patience is all about. You know, we give God time. You know, and, and, and it's something we need to remember. People think that God is late. Excuse me, I'm still here. What's going on here? Well, you know what? God has appointed times. Romans 15 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded towards one another according to Jesus Christ. Malachi, or some of you call it Malachi if you are Italian. <laughs> Malachi 2.17 you have wearied the Lord with your words. <clears throat> Yet you say, in what way have we wearied him? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or, where is the God of justice? They're asking, they're mocking, they're doubting. Psalm 3, 1 and 2. Lord, how they have increased who troubled me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Amazing. David was attacked by his own people. Where is your God? Where is his salvation? Hebrews 9, 28, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those 
who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time. To those who eagerly wait for him. Appear, not return, appear. It's different. He will appear. We will be taken. It's not the physical return of Christ to earth. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. In Romans 8, explain the salvation of our body. 1 Corinthians 1, 4-9. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. That you were enriched in everything by him in all utterness and all knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So that you come short in no gift. Eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who will also confirm you. To the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 8, 18 to 22. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. If somebody tells you. That believing in the soon return of Jesus is escapism. Is like, oh, that's an easy way to escape from troubles. Absolutely not. The opposite. I consider that the suffering of this present time. You acknowledge it that there is suffering in this present time. Are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. We need to wait. Luke 2. Simeon. What a great man. He was in Jerusalem. And he was just and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel. All the Israelites went to the temple. All of them brought sacrifices. All of them pretended that everything is the same. All of them ignored all the words of the prophets. All the expectation for the soon return of the Messiah. Soon arriving of the Messiah, excuse me. All of them ignored what Daniel said and what Isaiah said and what Jeremiah said. All of them were just living their days and their life as it's the same. And there was one man, old guy, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. See, the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, that's the key to have the hope, the expectation, the endurance, the patience, all of that. Because the Holy Spirit was upon him. In those days, the Holy Spirit was not in you. It was not, you were not sealed with the Holy Spirit. It is not yet arrived as the promise was, but it would come upon people and leave people. This is why David said, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Upon. And the Bible says it came upon him. He was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, the Lord's Messiah. He said, you are going to see the Messiah before you die. And he looks all around and he could say, ah. Everything is the same. He could. But no. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Bible says that he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. He took him up in the arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you, have, you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word for my Eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people. A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And the same Holy Spirit that can never, ever say anything different 
Because it's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same Lord. The same Holy Spirit is telling you today that he's about to return any day now. Galatians 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as sons. You see, when the fullness of the time had come, God has an appointed time. He's not working by our own schedule. He's asking us to be patient and to be ready. And let him do the rest. And the last thing he wants you to do is to mock and to be scoffers and to say, where is the promise of his coming? Because he is about to send just as when the fullness of the time had come, then he sent forth his son born of a woman. When the fullness of the times will come, He's going to send him back. It's amazing how God works. You know, I'm thinking about Daniel, the prophet. Daniel was so happy because Daniel knew the times. He knew the seasons. Daniel counted days, months, years. He knew that the prophecy that was written and spoken by Jeremiah, the prophet, is about to be fully filled. He knew that 70 years since the time they were kicked out of Jerusalem are about to come to an end. He was full of expectations. He was full of hope. And then the angel comes and says, hey, Daniel, I want to tell you something. I don't know what it is, but God really likes you. <laughs> and I want to tell you something, Daniel. From the beginning of your prayer, from the moment you opened your mouth, the decree was already given to me to come and tell you this thing. In other words, God decided, and the Archangel Gabriel had to fly very fast and come and tell Daniel something. That's the time. And then he says to Daniel, listen, Daniel, <laughs> I want to tell you something. Whatever you know about Jeremiah, 70 years, it's nice. It's good. But I'm about to reveal to you something even greater. So take your pen, take the scroll, and write it down. Because God has appointed times. And when the time comes, he's acting. Now he's not telling us sometimes the day or the hour. In certain times, by the way, he does tell us days. He tells us that there are seven years of tribulation. He tells us there is 1,260 days in the first half and 1,260 days in the other half. He tells us exactly how many months, how many years, how many days. We know all of those things. But he also says, regarding my coming to take you, no one knows the day and the hour because I want you to be ready at all time. Hmm. Sounds familiar, this, this whole fullness of the time. Romans 11, which is going to be the topic of our next message. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. There is a set time. We're going to talk about it, if you're still here. <laughs> Revelation 5, verses 1 to 10. And I saw in the, in the right hand of him, who sat on the throne, a scroll, written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw, you see, John was brought up to heaven. After he spoke to the church, about the church, now chapter 4, the Lord calls him up and says, I want you to see what's going up there, what's going on there. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scrolls or to look at it. So I wept much. John wept. A whole plan of God is based 
on that scroll that somebody has to open. The hope. And he's weeping. I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll and to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne... And of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent unto it into all the earth. And then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Worthy is the lamb. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. There is a great promise that we will be in heaven Groomed to come back and reign with him on the earth. And you want to tell me that I should weep and cry that there is no one worthy to open the seal? John wept because he didn't understand what's going on here. I thought that I'm coming to heaven and everything is already set. Everything is set. But John, we're not working according to your schedule. There is one that is worthy. And he is going to open the scroll and, and, and end the, the, loose its seven seals when the time comes. Because he has already won. He has already been a victorious. He is the one who prevailed. He has prevailed and he will. He will open the scroll. He will loose its seven seals. There will be a great tribulation. There will be great catastrophe. Those things are given to us in the book of Revelation all the way almost to chapter 19. We see all of that. But we, we are meant to be up there. We are meant to be groomed to become the kings and priests. So we shall reign on the earth. Indeed, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. He redeemed us to God by his blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And has made us all kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no rep reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Even to death of, on the cross. Therefore God. God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of those in heaven and on those of earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He has won. So... Uh, 
The hope is that he's coming back. And I will end up with his words, not mine. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen? Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. So Father, we thank you so much for this promise. We thank you that he who promised is faithful. We thank you, Father, that having the Holy Spirit surrounding ourselves with the right people, like-minded people, being encouraged by your promises, we want to wait upon you with patience and perseverance because the Lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. He has already won. And when the time comes, he will return to take us And until then, he expects us to share the hope of his soon return everywhere, every day, to all people. And let not the scoffers mess up our mind and tell us where is the promise of his coming. He who promised indeed is faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.